Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining Robin and I today. I just want to take a quick moment to remind you that these hangouts are being sponsored by the scholarship membership site.com. So with that being said, um, we're going to go ahead and uh, talk about a resource or an extracurricular activity that I highly, highly, highly recommend. And one of the things I love is that books are a great resource that are very cost efficient and share a lot of knowledge and you can do them at your own pace. So today I want to share with you a book that has made a huge impact on the way I write, my writing style, and how I think about approaching um, any kind of topic that I want to write about. So this is the book. Um, the author is Gary Spence and it's called How to Argue and Win Every Time. And he's an attorney, and he's very, very well known. He's done uh, won several high-profile cases, and he writes the argument, and he talks persuasively to jurors. So he does a lot of preparation work, and it pays off very well for him and for his clients. And just the insight that he gave as far as how to prepare your arguments, I thought was really interesting because you're not really. I don't see him as really arguing. I see him more as persuading the jury just kind of as you would want to persuade a scholarship judge panel to want to rule in your favor. So I think there's a lot of parallels and um, when you're writing I think that it's great because when you want to be persuasive you know it's good to use that time and to use it wisely because what you really get to do is you get to have the opportunity to listen to me. I call it the listen to me opportunity. I have an important story to tell and I want you to listen to me, my point of view, what's going on in my life. And it's an opportunity to share what's going on and that's how people are going to know about you. They're not going to know about you unless you share about yourself. So with that being said, um, one of the things that I like is, I there's several things that I like, but um, there's an opening quote I want to go ahead and start with and uh, it says, incredible power of credibility. Standing naked, the law. No one listens to me. Why should they? Who am I? The key. Anyone can be credible, but we must risk telling the truth about ourselves. And I think that's really important because a lot of times people go into scholarships thinking, well, I haven't done anything major or significant. Like, who am I to get the money? Like, who am I to tell a story that people are going to want to hand me, you know, especially if you think of money as being hard-earned. Why does someone want to want to give me their hard-earned money to someone they don't know? And what he's really saying is tell the truth. You have a story. Your experiences are your story. And it's more about how you talk about your experiences that's going to persuade someone. I really love this idea that credibility equals validity believability. So when you talk about your own personal experiences, you have credibility because you went through it. You knew what it was like. You have a first person account of what happens and how you feel and what's going on. Especially when you have these colorful things that happen in your past and you have to cope with it, you're able to say, you know, I was successful or I did this. So, you know, instead of maybe being ashamed of something you went through, you know, whether it was poverty, abuse, whatever, you know, people have all kinds of things in their past, you don't really need to be ashamed of it. It's, you didn't make that choice or decision to be there. Sometimes life happens to you. And I know for me, when I was, you know, trying to get started, the only experience I had was babysitting. And I didn't think of that as real experience. But when I changed my frame of mind and think of, oh, someone trusts me with, you know, a kid that, you know, a woman, who carries this baby inside of her for nine months, that requires a lot of trust. And when I changed my perspective as far as what skills I had and started seeing it differently, then that made a huge impact on me. And one of the ways that I did that was someone who wrote me a letter of recommendation put that in the letter of recommendation. And I was really surprised because I had done all these other things for her. That was the thing that she was most proud of. Her kids were the joy and light of her life. And to say that meant a lot. So I thought that was really interesting. It's about your perspective and how you talk about it. But um, certainly I do want to read a little bit about from the book. Um, I'm hoping that by reading about it, it will certainly inspire you to want to read it yourself, to go out and buy the book and read it. 
So I'm going to go ahead and read two paragraphs. And it's basically the author, Gary Spence, talking about uh, an experience he had. So let me begin by telling you a story. Early in my career, I was standing before a jury making my final argument. Stiff with fear, I held tightly to the lecture. I had prepared my arguments as I had been scheduled, as I have, uh, sorry, um, as you prepare yours, written it, outlined it, and tried to memorize it. And now, all I could do was read it. I was afraid to look up for fear I'd lose my place. I was afraid to look at the jury for fear their bold looks would be so disconcerting. I would fumble and stammer and then go blank. Suddenly, my papers fell from the lectern and went flying across the courtroom. Red with embarrassment and sweating, I began to pick them up. I could hear the snickers of the people in the audience. I caught a glimpse of my client's face frozen in terror. When I finally retrieved my papers, they were in a hopeless disarray. I didn't know where I had left off, nor where to begin. I thought I would die. I prayed I would die. But God did not oblige. I had no choice. In terror, I looked at the drawers and looked back. Sorry, I mumbled. And then it came blurting out. I wish I could talk to you without these notes. I wish I could tell you what's in my heart and how I really feel about this case. If you only knew. Why? The facts are clear. Jimmy here, my client, is innocent. And you know why I know? And suddenly, the magical argument had begun. And what I like about it is that he talks about, you know, your passion. What, you know, usually you go through these experiences, and in this particular culture, we've been taught to suppress, you know, not to show our emotions, you know, don't cry, you know, um, a strong person doesn't cry, or a strong person doesn't show their emotions. And so sometimes it's hard for us to communicate what we've been through, or when we talk about what we've been through, we talk with this sort of monotone, like, oh, yes, this is what happened. These are the facts. Let's just stick to the facts. And he talks about how people get bored of hearing just the facts. You know, you want to tell a story. You want to show them what happened. You want, you know, there's a saying like, um, you don't know what someone else's experience is like until you walk a day in their shoes. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you're painting a picture so that they understand. And he gives a really, really good, um, he sums it up by saying, uh, show me, don't tell me. And what I like about that is it, it's helping the other person understand your situation, what's going on, and why you deserve it. What obstacles did you overcome? What is it that you want about this? And I think that sometimes it makes it more interesting to read your uh, paper, you know, your scholarship essay, your admissions application. There's a whole lot. Like, I mean, you never know how many people apply. It could be, you know, 20 people apply. It could be 500 people that apply. So that when you're writing, you want it to be interesting. You want it to be telling a story so that people want to read it. They want to devour what you've written. They want to enjoy hearing your message and your story. And so I think this is a, a great thing that he says. He says, um, you know, to rephrase something, don't say he suffered in pain. Tell me what it felt like to have a broken leg with the bone sticking out through the flesh. And to me, this was a great summary of how most of us would write. Most of us would say he suffered in pain. Well, you know, how much pain? It doesn't really tell, illustrate a, a picture. It just sounds kind of boring. It's, it's like a summary bullet point of what's going on. But when someone says, tell me what it felt like, now you're involving the emotions. The human spirit is getting involved. And then when you go into a little bit more detail, of it's not just a broken leg. Well, you know, be more graphic with the bone sticking out through his flesh. That's a very, very strong visual image that evokes feeling. It evokes emotion. It evokes so much within inside of ourselves. And that's really what you want. You want people to connect with what you're saying. And if what you're saying is very dry, very monotone, very bullet point, then people have a hard time connecting with it. Bullet points are great. I love them for organizing ideas or to make sure that you're really getting to the point and you know they're answering the questions that's been asking. But that is just a step in the process when you write your essay. 
and on previous videos as we have done and seen, um, you know, we use those bullet points to make sure that we're answering each question in each paragraph and then it helps us to rearrange those ideas you know, for what's our introductory sentence or topic sentence, what are our supporting points, and what's our transition into the next next paragraph. So everything has its place, and it all has a relationship on how it interacts with each other. But again, you know, it takes time to learn these things. And, um, you know, I wasn't always a great advocate of reading, but I learned to fall in love with it. And I think that's part of the thing that people go through with school is sometimes they don't love school or they hate school, and so they have a hard time making that bridge over into something that they enjoy. And for me, my personal hardship was I was held back in second grade because I couldn't read. I felt like I was stupid. I felt like, you know, everybody else was smarter than me, and I'd never get it. And I was very, very fortunate to have a couple of friends that changed my outlook on how to read and uh, the joy and the information how it can help you. So I hope that by sharing my stories of what I enjoy and you can hear my enthusiasm coming across will encourage you to want to do the same. And there was two, two particular things that um, I had two friends and they each did something different that really helped me move, move beyond where I was. And one friend used to read to me and you know, or he tell me about this book. Crystal, I read this really great book. You've got to read this. You know, and I'd be like, well, why? And he'd be like, oh, well, I read this, or it was interesting. And he'd always leave me on a cliffhanger. He would never tell me what actually happened. He always just told me enough to get me interested. So <laughs> that's why I'm like, oh, okay, well, if it, you know, it worked for me, maybe it'll work for other people. So that's why I want to read enough of the book to entice you to want to go out and buy it. Um, you know, and I do feel like it's a great tool. The other friend I had told me, you know, if you don't enjoy reading, it's because you haven't found the right book. There's books written on everything about every topic. There's different writing styles. And maybe you just don't like reading because you experience a very limited selection of books. I thought, huh, wow, that's pretty powerful. Like, I don't know what I don't like. So, like, I don't know unless I start finding other books that I like. And that just seemed like a lot of effort because you walk into a big library and all these books everywhere. Or you walk into a bookstore and there's all these books everywhere. And I'm like, I don't know where to start. I don't know who's good. I get bored reading easily. So one of the things that I found that works for me now is when I did find someone that I like, or I like their writing style, I like them as an author, I like them as a person, I like their, uh, their perspective that they bring to the world or how they help me see things differently, for how they've helped me with my career, and they recommend books, I'm like, ooh, let me go get that book, because maybe that helped shape that person or help mold them, and that'll help mold me. And so it goes into having this role model uh, figure that's kind of handing down the knowledge, but also at the same time, I look at it as I'm having other people screen that information for me. So instead of me going into a bookstore and trying to figure out or in this case, having Robin going into a bookstore trying to figure out, hey, I want to increase, you know, my writing ability. Who, what, what book do I get? That's a lot of time and energy just trying to figure out which one to get and going through it, reading the cover, figuring out, do I want to pay for it? Is it really worth it? Am I going to have the time? You know, it just makes sense when you have someone else recommend you a book, someone you know, like, and trust. It's a referral, and it's, you know, this is something that's going to help you when you have the time and certainly your dedication level is also going to play a big part into it. And so luckily with the internet, if you can't, don't have a local bookstore, you can buy a book. You can get a used book for a very, very economical price. I have actually um, found or discovered that a lot of the books that are online for sale that are used are books that are donated to thrift shops. And a lot of the thrift shops are putting the books online as a way to generate money. So <laughs> it's okay to get into a habit of buying books. There's always another economical way to get around it if you can't afford a full price book. But there's certainly so much education and knowledge in this. And this is written by someone with real world experience. He's very, very good at what he does. I look at this as, you know, a book, say, for $20 is 
so much more affordable than being able to hire him for a one-hour consulting session to explain what he does and how he does it. So that's one of the reasons I absolutely positively love books. So, well, <laughs> I know, I know. But uh, so, but basically, really, what his whole book comes down to, it's really about one idea. And for me, or what I took out of it anyway, is the clarity of your thoughts, the clarity to communicate. And when you know what you what you want to communicate, when you sit with yourself and say, okay, what is it that I'm really trying to say, or what is it that I'm really trying to persuade people to do, then it makes it easier for you to choose the right words or the right metaphors or to connect with your audience and be able to say something in a way that moves them to want to take action. Because you're not just writing to give something informative. It's not just, oh, this is an informative speech or a report. It's, I want the person reading this to take action. I want the people reading this to award me scholarship money. I want these people to grant me admissions into this college. And so from that standpoint, you're persuading people to take an action and to do something, and you're giving them a lot of good reasons. So you've got to think about, well, why, why would I want someone to do this? You know, what is it that I have to share with the world? You know, that would encourage someone or motivate them or to move them to want to help me out. And so, again, I think a lot of it comes back to the way we think. It's not just our ability to write and be great at English and type away. It's a lot of times it starts with the message that's within our heart, and then are we able to clearly communicate that as well. So certainly, um, you know, yes, it does take time to understand reading can take some time, but for what it's worth, it'll help you out in a lot of different areas. Um, it'll also help you out beyond school and also in your personal life. And one of the things I also really like about the book is he explains that, like, how do you use it in your personal life? How do you use it at work? You know, it's the same being able to communicate these ideas and the clarity of your thoughts. This is something that can be used in several different aspects of your life not just at work, not just at home, not just in your personal romantic relationship. So, with that being said, do you have any comments, Robin? Um, yeah, I just, I really like what you're saying about um, certain books that, you know, and even you talking about how much you love the book and how much um, it means to you, There, they, yeah, there's definitely books growing up that I, and for me, it's like more self-help books, which I guess this is kind of similar to a self-help book, but um, that's the thing that I'm always, I've always been interested in and gravitated towards. Um, and for a long time, I beat myself up because I didn't, I hadn't read a lot of literature and I thought that that's what, you know, smart people read. And, um, that's just not what I was exposed to in the home. I did read some books um, through school, thankfully, and I have a pretty good base knowledge of most of those famous books. But for some of them, they were they were boring to me, and they didn't resonate with me. I guess that was another thing you were kind of talking about. But for some reason, self-help books and books on psychology and books on sociology and, and that kind of stuff really resonated. And... I have a few key authors that over the years, um, I, so when I first read it, I would underline stuff, and then I go back and I read the underlined stuff when I need, like, a kind of mental, you know, like a boost, um, and just a reminder to, like, ground myself to be like, oh, yeah, that's right, this this is what this person that I really highly respect, um, this is what they said, this is what spoke to me years ago. I just I just kind of forgot because maybe I got consumed with lots of other things. So um, I really appreciate what you said about that. And yeah, just encouraging people to find books on topics that are interesting to them. Then like you said, there's so many different kinds of books. Even at one point I had a phase where I was really into graphic novels and there's some really great graphic novels that are written on um, that are based on historical events. So you can be reading a graphic novel, but be learning about history while you're doing it. Or it could just be a fun story, whatever. But um, there are ways for all of us to to learn in the way that works best for us. Um, 
So just to put that out there to anyone. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate what you're saying. And then um, in terms of writing my personal statement, because that's kind of where I'm, I'm at, um, I think... Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to read the whole book uh, before the time that my personal statement is due, but I'll definitely, um, just to be honest, uh, <laughs> I'll definitely <laughs> research um, him and kind of, uh, kind of go over the bullet points that you talked about. Uh, I think it's really helpful for me to be reminded to show, don't tell, and I feel like I have a lot to show. Um, and I have a lot to tell, but let's show it instead. And, uh, yeah, and then something about, we had talk, you talked about bullet points, and if I'm thinking back to a couple videos ago, um, those bullet points have been really helpful because what I've been doing the last few weeks is I go to the bullet points, and then just in, in when I have a few moments in downtime, I go to a bullet point and just start free writing on that bullet point. And so... Um, and, you know, in my head I keep saying, like, well, I still haven't written the whole thing, I still haven't written the whole thing, and then the other side's like, yeah, but when I go back and look at all the bullet points that I've expanded, I've been doing a lot of work. So, yeah, so I'm just going to say that. I'm, <laughs> I will have a lot of <laughs> work for us to go over. Um, but, yeah, the bullet points were helpful in, in getting, making sure that the questions were answered, but then the bullet points kind of opened up where I could really have my voice and have a dialogue um, with the question and kind of just break it down and explore it in my own in my own voice and then I will go back and polish it up but um, so that's been really helpful yeah I have to say on that yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, I certainly don't expect you to, like, read this whole entire thing, like, before the end of this year. I mean, you have about approximately two years, I'm sorry, two weeks before you have to have uh, your college admission essay complete. But it's something that, you know, in the process of continuously growing, that I think will help you, you know, for several things, especially with the scholarships, which is kind of where I want to frame your mindset, because... I think when you write your college admissions essay, you have so much that you're sharing. It's so rich from all your experiences. It's amazing. But because a lot of that's personal, I think that when it comes time to write a scholarship, you're going to have much more of a challenging time sharing some of those personal experiences. And so we've kind of got to reframe it, and it's like, okay, well, do I either get her to feel comfortable talking about some of her personal experiences, which you shared with me off the air, or do we start leaning towards the idea of how do you be persuasive as far as, you know, okay, as I'm getting comfortable talking about my experiences, what is it that I really want? And let's start focusing on I want the money to help me go to college so I can help other people in the way that I've been helped. And I think because of your experiences, when you mention that in the, in the scholarship, scholarship judges will be like, oh, like, that's kind of a touchy topic. We understand if she doesn't want to share that, that much information. And because you're not going to be sharing that much information, that means you're going to have this void that's going to need to be filled. And therefore, I think it's, you know, better to lean on the side of being persuasive, understanding how, how you are going to be a good steward of the money to help other people. And that is a skill that I think that we're often not taught in school or in life and other things, and it's very helpful. Uh, even, especially for a lot of different careers, you know, when you're asking for the money, what about when you're marketing? You mm -hmm. know, you're marketing or you're selling something or you're a manager. You know, you need resources, you need money, you need something, you need time. <laughs> you know, you need extra employees. And so this idea of being persuasive is a skill that I think you know, applying for colleges and applying for scholarships, it's a great opportunity to practice that skill within a safe environment. Because if someone says no, you're not going to feel too bad because you're like, okay, there's plenty of other scholarships to apply for. So I'm not going to take that personally. Maybe there was someone else who was a better fit. Or maybe I, you know, applied to a scholarship and someone like Crystal, who had read this sort of resource, is the person that, you know, got the scholarship. So really what you're trying to do is you're trying to put the odds in your favor. 
Nice. <laughs> yeah, I just thinking about like personally um, as we've done these videos and I've worked through my own personal issues, I, I feel like maybe around the time that I start applying for scholarships I'll feel a little bit more comfortable talking about certain aspects of my life, but also to really focus on what I've done on my own to heal from those um, traumatic events and maybe that's where the persuasion comes in because it's it's like yeah so I had had these things happen and and I can sit in that or I can talk about the fact that like yeah these things happened and this is what I did with it this is how I leveraged this traumatic event where I suffered and this is how I moved forward so I guess I'm just I'm trying to apply what you're saying to like my real life situation of of how I can persuade them. And right. I'm feeling a lot more confident around that. And that's the thing, too. I think part of it is when we go through things, we feel like, oh, we're ashamed because I'm not perfect. I either didn't have the high GPA or, you know, I wasn't, you know, voted the most important team member on my sports team or, you know, in my career I wasn't voted or nominated for this particular award, you know, employee of the month or whatever it is. You know, I think a lot of times we tend to not realize how much we've done or accomplished. And at this point, it's what do you feel comfortable talking about and what do you feel comfortable with sharing? There's certainly going to be a range of things that you're going to feel comfortable talking about depending upon what your life experiences are. And so there's going to be certain things that you're kind of on the fence. You're not really sure, should I share it or should I not share it? And those are the experiences that I'm hoping that we can reframe your perspective and talk about, well, yeah, I guess that would really help if I talked about that situation in a different light. You yes. know, some people will sit there and say, um, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things that I read about in a newspaper one time was someone who got a scholarship who was a single mother who used to be in an abusive relationship. And I love the way this article was written about her because she basically said, you know, I want to change my situation so much so that I don't know what to do except for ask for help because everything she had tried had failed and she couldn't do it on her own. And she just got to the point where she was sick and tired and she asked people, hey, can you help me? And they just kind of like shrug her off, like help yourself, like right? You know, go to the college admissions advisor, go do whatever. And she just got so sick and tired of people not helping her. She was like, look, I'm in an abusive relationship. I'm trying to get out. The best thing I know I can do is to go to school so I can get a good paying job. And people were like, whoa, like, okay. Like, <laughs> that's, that's pretty intense. So, you know, even from that standpoint, even though she had this colorful, vibrant past, she was still able to go forward. And, you know, even, even people who do really well in school – and who don't have that colorful past, usually have something else that they can connect with. And I think that everybody has these really, really rich experiences, but we might not see them as rich in experiences. We might think, oh, everybody has these experiences, or my experience isn't any different. And another thing I come across is people think, oh, well, everybody has a 4.0. Well, not really everybody, but so many people have it that it doesn't hold the prestige that it used to have. So it's like, okay, well, then what else do you got to talk about? You know, it's not just about your grades. That's why, you know, a lot of these college applications ask about your community involvement. And it's usually how you talk about that community involvement, again, how you, how you talk about it in a persuasive manner that persuades people, oh, she really does care about what she's doing or why did she do this or how is she making an impact or why is she going to be a good steward if we award this money to this person. So again, it goes back to how do you talk? So certainly, um, <laughs> I know you're a very good listener, and I like to rant and rave and talk a lot, but um, I did want to keep this hangout short because it seems like our shorter hangouts have been more uh, full of content, more full of different things. And certainly, I do want to get to the point where if there's something that you feel like you need some clarity, on. Like, I certainly would be happy if you recommended uh, topics if you wanted me to dive into. And certainly, as our viewership is growing, I'd appreciate if viewers were like, oh, that's good. I wonder if we could talk more about this or more about that. Uh, that would certainly help as well.
So um, we have been on this hangout for approximately 30 minutes or so. So I think it was a really good show. Um, I certainly look forward to doing uh, more that are coming up. Um, I'm very, very excited about one that I'm preparing to do for tomorrow night to just kind of give everybody a little teaser. But um, Dr. Pepper has a really good scholarship program, and they're giving away a lot of money. And I'm helping Xavier apply for scholarships. And it's great because on our last hangout, his mom was like, oh, you need 15 more votes. Like, uh, maybe I can have my, you know, send a tweet out to, to my peeps. And, you know, her coworkers and friends could vote for him so he'd be eligible to get, uh, to be able to submit a video for this scholarship. Because you have to have 50 votes. And so I'm going through and I'm analyzing the videos of last year's winners and pulling out some of the really good things that they did in their one minute video about how they talked about themselves, what they did. Uh, some of the thing, some of the key pieces that I see in each of these winning scholarships. So I'm really, really excited about what's coming up in the future. And um, certainly, I know I have a lot of good content, but I want to get into a, a point where we're having a dialogue with other people and the viewers because I know you have a lot of questions that you want answered. And sometimes I'm offering all this information, and I know it can be a lot to drink from, but I do want to start answering your questions too. So please feel free to leave comments um, on the event page, and certainly I will be looking at those, replying back, and uh, taking that to account when I plan for future videos. So thank you everybody for watching. Uh, thank you Robin for participating, and I do want to applaud you for what you did today. Yay! Uh, <laughs> you went ahead and, well, do you want to go ahead and tell people what you did? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... I submitted the names of my four references, which are the letter of recommendation writers. And uh, the way that I did it through the school is I input the name and the email address, and then an email was generated to the letter writers. Um, and I heard word that it went through today. So um, that's just another piece of the puzzle. Um, that I, I am just, I'm really excited that I, I've put one foot in front of the other and I'm, I'm continuing to move forward with this process even when in my head there's there's voices that are like, no, this isn't going to happen, it's not going to work. I There's the other voice that feels a lot stronger that's like, and I'm going to do it anyways because, you know what, like I, I feel, I feel confident, I feel this just, this is feeling right and just going to keep moving forward. So um, I have a few more forms. So the big thing is the personal statement, but um, I need to get my resume in. And then um, for this specific school, there's a field placement form, which talks about the internship portion of the schooling. And uh, so I plan this next week, I have off from work. Um, and I plan to use my time wisely. And, uh, but yeah, so, but just to focus on today, yes, I was able to solidify the four letter of recommendations, and uh, that feels really big. That was, for me, it was a very huge process to reconnect with people, to ask for something as, as big as a letter of recommendation about my skills and abilities and talents and I really challenged a lot of <laughs> a lot of um, stories about myself um, but you know what I did it and yeah and it wasn't that hard <laughs> once I did it of course leading up to it it was a little stressful but yeah so thanks for letting me uh, share that. You're welcome. And I think it's important for you to share that, your progress, because you are making progress. There are a lot of steps that need to be done, and we certainly want to celebrate along the way. And I think that's part of changing our patterns and our behaviors is we tend to think, oh, we'll celebrate once we have the big grand uh, finale. And it, there's always a grand finale. And it's like, okay, well, when do you stop and celebrate? You've been working really hard. Do you wait till after you graduate to celebrate? And then you're like, well, no, that might not be a good time because what about employment? 
So, you know, we need to stop and take this time to celebrate all the progress that we're doing and create these positive reinforcement moments. So I really appreciate you being willing to share your experience with everybody who's watching and uh, just kind of give us a, a weekly progress of how you're doing. And, you know, having someone else to, sh to celebrate it with certainly makes it fun. And you do deserve that acknowledgement because you are making the effort and you're doing it. But not only that, you're being held accountable in public. Yeah. And I think that's going to motivate other people as well. So certainly you're doing an awesome job. Keep it up. Keep going. And uh, I wish you a happy holidays and everybody watching a happy holidays. And we will keep in touch and we will see you next week. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.